morning, church. Um, today's teaching text comes from John 14, verses 25 to 26, and I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It reads as follows. I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. This is the word of the Lord. Well, fam, here we are, week 12 of 12. Let's back up quickly and fly over the whole series, okay? I want to remind you where we were because I think it's important to look back on any journey. And I also want to compel you to catch up if you missed out or if you some, uh, at some point hopped off the bus. And I also want to show you how we covered uh, quite a significant portion of the Bible in terms of all the books that we preach from. So, uh, take a look at it with me. On the 16th of April, we launched with a theme, The Invitation. That was from Matthew 11. I preached that one the week after. Peter preached um, on Matthew 13, A Hidden Treasure and a Priceless Pearl. Week after that, I was back on with The New Command, and that came from the Gospel of John. So, two Gospels in there. And then Lesecho preached on the 7th of May, the year of the Lord's favor from the Gospel of Luke. Week after that, he preached from the Gospel of Matthew, and he spoke about murder begins in the heart. After that, I preached at Pier van Reinefeld. You guys will remember that our church went for a joint worship service at one of our sending churches, and I preached on Matthew 13 uh, around the theme of guarding our hearts. The week after that, Shiami preached on the disciple and anxiety. You might not know this, but this is hands down and by far the most watched sermon of this whole series on our YouTube channel. So nice one, mate. By far, by far, the more views. So uh, there you go. Then I was back on. I preached from Psalm 1. Uh, a theme, The Two Ways. Lesecho preached on Deuteronomy chapter 6. The words of God I preached while I was taking us home towards the end of the series. Speaking with wisdom two weeks ago and last week, walking in the light. We covered four Gospels. We covered uh, the Torah or the law in the Old Testament. We covered wisdom literature in Proverbs. Um, we covered a New Testament epistle. It's quite, we, we covered quite some ground in this series. So I think it's worth it to just take a moment and just to reflect on what has happened in you and to you over the last 12 weeks. In the beginning of every sermon, we said that we want to invite you to deeper everything. Do you remember that? I had a little list. I'll mention it again. So how do we go deeper? It's a really important question for all followers of Jesus. I mean, think about this. We can preach the most beautiful things. The question is always, yes, but how? I mean, we have to be able to answer that question to apply what we hear to our lives. So how do we go deeper? I've got an answer for you. Listen, the Holy Spirit. That's the answer. How do we go deeper? Through the Holy Spirit. For real. Through the Holy Spirit, we can know, understand, experience, listen, transform, see, feel, read, love, give, and share deeper. Do you want this? I do too. Well then, tune in as we are going to learn about the Holy Spirit today. Three simple questions. Who is the Holy Spirit? What does He do? And how do we receive what He gives? I think the map is on there. Who is the Holy Spirit? What does He do? And how do we receive what He gives? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we open up Your Word now, we submit to it. We want to learn from it. We want to be transformed by it. We want the Word to illuminate our hearts and our minds as we uh, journey in this life of faith as Your followers. Holy Spirit, we pray that You move among us. And that you would teach us, that you would remind us, that you would counsel us, that you would be our advocate in this time. I thank you, Father God, for the testimonies we heard now. Thank you that we could have um, gotten to a deeper understanding of your love and the power of your word and the beauty of your grace. It pleases me, Father God, to see how you journey with your children and how you form us into the image of Christ through your Holy Spirit. It, it, it's phenomenal to behold. And we praise you for that together as a church this morning. Have your way in us. Um, 
please also anoint my lips and guide my every word as we look at this important passage of Scripture. We pray that your name be glorified, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so before we get into the question, who is the Holy Spirit, let me just give you some context, right? Because we're jumping into the Gospel of John all the way through in chapter 14, all the way through in verse 26. So let me show you a slide. John 14 to 17 well, actually 13 to 17, but more 14 to 17, is called the Upper Room Discourse. Okay, it's a weird name, but it is Jesus speaking to his disciples around a table in a place that they call the Upper Room. Now, this is a great place in the Bible to look for answers to these questions. Why? Because you'll see that the Holy Spirit is mentioned quite a significant amount of time. So in this discourse, in the speech of Jesus, you'll see that he says he's going away so that he can send the Spirit. And the key to that line is then Jesus can go from one place at a time to all place at all times. The Spirit is mentioned again when Jesus talks about this one God consisting of a re loving relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit, this beautiful oneness. You also see here in the fourth part of his speech that Jesus says the Spirit will empower his followers to carry on his mission, right? So through the Spirit, we'll be able to do acts of loving service and we'll also be able to bear witness to the truth. The Spirit plays an important role in the way that we abide in Christ, the way that we intentionally stay with no intention to go. And obviously the Holy Spirit plays a massive role when we receive opposition because the Holy Spirit gives us courage and gives us words and gives us wisdom as we defend the truth. And then Jesus says, after all of this Spirit talk, do not be afraid because I have gained victory over the world, right? So that's where we are in the Gospel of John. Now, somehow in the church, I don't know why, but somehow in the church we've got two ends of a spectrum. The one end says, we've got the Spirit, yes we do, we've got the Spirit, how about you? And then the other end says, there's something about the Spirit that we can't understand and that we can't explain, so rather stick to teaching about the Spirit and not exp necessarily experiencing the Spirit. I don't think it should be that way. I don't think it should be either or. I think it should be both and. We should obviously have an understanding of the Spirit, but we should also experience the Spirit. And these two things can't be mutually exclusive. They are supposed to be um, part of the same thing. I mean, think about this, fam. The definition of a miracle is when the supernatural invades the natural. What is more supernatural than the Holy Spirit invading our lives? Think about it. What is more supernatural than the Holy Spirit and what is more natural than a human being? So when the Spirit indwells us, that's one of the greatest miracles we could behold. So we should have both of those, an understanding of the Spirit and an experience of the Spirit. I think we should be in the center as the church. Okay, so who is the Holy Spirit? It starts with a pronoun. And that pronoun is He. So the Holy Spirit is the personal, divine resident of the Christian's heart. Okay? I had to choose, am I going to say Christian's life or Christian's heart? But we've said all along in this series that the Christian's heart is the middle of your life. Right? That's where your whole life originates. And the Holy Spirit is the personal, divine resident of the Christian's heart. It's a He, not a It. The Holy Spirit is not an energy or a force. The Holy Spirit is a person. Look at John uh, 14, verse 17. He, there you go. And you will receive Him, and He will remain with you and will be with you. Ephesians 4.30 says the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Hebrews 10.29 says the Holy Spirit can be outraged. Romans 15 says the Holy Spirit loves. An impersonal force, fam, cannot feel those feelings. Only a person can. And that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also God. Okay, Look at verse 16. Jesus says, I will ask the Father... And He, the Father, will give you, His followers, another counselor to do what? To be with you forever. Now, the New Testament was written in Greek. 
And the Greek word for another is quite an interesting word because they've got two Greek words where we have one English word, which is another. So the one is hetero, that means opposed or different. The other one is alos, and that means just like the former, it's just another one of the former. Are you following? Okay, so it's not he's going to send you one that's totally different. It is he's going to send you another one that is the same. Now think about the Gospels as we have them written in the Bible. Jesus claims to be God, right? By doing what God does and has always done. Jesus even appropriates the divine name of God, I am, saying those words with his own mouth in the Gospel of John, right? Seven times I am, I am, I am, I am. And Jesus also says that I am the counselor, I'm the one that is with you now, and I will send you another one like me. Okay, so it's all intertwined. We often speak about a personal relationship with Jesus. You've heard people say that. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Now, the fact that Jesus was a human being is a great gift for us because we can kind of understand what a personal relationship with Jesus is like because he was a human being in the flesh. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, we should also talk about the Holy Spirit in terms of a personal relationship. And I think we sometimes miss that. Let me show you two pictures as an illustration. The Holy Spirit is not a force. Because if it was a force, then we would treat it in a mechanical way. Okay? In a country filled with load shedding, electricity is a force. Okay? I'm just reminding you for when you actually do have it. What happens if your battery reaches 18%? Full-scale panic, and what do you do? You look for a charger. That's what you do. I need the force. And you'll keep on looking, and you'll keep on looking until you find it, either a power bank, or an inverter, or just a normal plug. You guys will remember what those look like, right? And then you put your telephone on the charger, and then you get the force. And then what do you do? You just leave it right there. It's all done. It's mechanical. I need something now. I get it. I find it. And I use it. That is not how the Holy Spirit works. But sometimes people talk about the Holy Spirit as if it is. Oh, need some spirit now. Invoke the force. And then I have it. And then I'm done. I don't think that's a good metaphor. I think there's a better one. Can I have the next slide, please, Rudolf? I think we should speak about the Holy Spirit as someone at your welcome mat, at your door, wanting to come into your life and moving in permanently. Think about it. If I have someone rocking up at my door, then you create space for that person, don't you? You welcome that person. You kind of rearrange your whole existence around that person. And if that person is staying forever, then you take that person into account in everything you do in your house. You also approach that person to speak to them and say, may I ask you something? You also um, need to take advice from that person, asking what should I do? You also allow that person to interrupt you. I mean, imagine if there's a guest in your house and you're busy washing dishes and the person taps you on the shoulder, what are you going to do? You're going to stop doing the dishes, you're going to shake off the foam, sunlight, and then you're going to go, yeah. So you'll pardon the interruption if there's someone in your house. And you'll take them into account in everything you do. That's the way we should experience the Holy Spirit. And that's the way we should think about the Holy Spirit. And that's the kind of relationship that we should grow into. My simple question to you is, is this your experience? Is this your experience of the Holy Spirit? Because I can guarantee you that it will change everything in your life. I wish I had time to explain it all, but what I can say to you now is that this will lead to you knowing, understanding, experiencing, listening, transforming, seeing, feeling, reading, loving, giving, and sharing deeper. Why? Because that is what the Spirit does once He's moved into your life. Now, there's two really important growth points here. I wanted to say applications, but I think it's growth points because I think all of us need to grow in it, right? The one is the words obey right away. The day I got saved, the person who shared the gospel with me 
Look me in the eye, just before I got into my student car, Opel Corsa 160 IS, wide wheels, free flow exhaust, two 6 by 9s in the back. I rolled like a proper job Pretoria student at that time. And I was standing in the door of my Corsa, wanting to turn it on to hear the verpa verpa on my pipe. And he said to me, listen right now, you're going to feel the Holy Spirit starting to work inside of you now. Here's what I want you to do. Obey right away. And then he left. He didn't tell me where the Spirit is. He didn't tell me what the Spirit's voice sounded like. He just said to me, the Spirit will now start working inside of you. Here's what I want you to do. Obey right away. Fam, that was probably one of the most important moments in my spiritual journey over the last 18 years. Because as I sat in the car, I had this feeling. But was it a thought? Was it a feeling? Was it a thought? Was it me? Was it a voice? Was it my conscience? But all I knew was I had to go and say sorry to my mom for all the pain that I've caused her. And I got into the car and I went home and I said, Mom, the Holy Spirit told me that I should say sorry. And she just broke down weeping. And she was like, I cannot tell you how long I prayed for you to do this. And I went, yes, I think that's how it works. Okay, 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 okay. Now I need to focus for when it happens again. Because when it happens, I need to obey right away. The fact that I'm a pastor today in a church preaching is because I learned how to obey right away. I sat in church one morning. I was on my way to become a chartered accountant. I love myself an Excel spreadsheet and some left brain thinking. And I felt God say to me, I've given you a voice. Come and work for me. Go and study theology. And I went, okay. Okay. And then I elbowed my grandma because she was next to me in church. And I was like, hey, grandma, I'm going to become a pastor. And she's like, okay, yeah, dude, go for gold. And that evening I said to my parents, listen, uh, God said to me this morning, I have to start studying theology and I'm going to do it. And they said, it seems like that's how you roll. Like since you came to faith, if he tells you to do something, you do it. So go for it. And here I am today, not a chartered accountant by all means, still love myself for Excel spreadsheet, I have to say, but not an accountant at all, doing what I'm doing now because I obeyed right away. It's a really important part of our faith uh, and our journey as followers of Jesus. And then the second one, this is another big growth point, listen, 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 listen. There you go, keeping quiet. Keeping quiet. And just listening. Do you ever do it? Like, do you sit, acknowledge God's presence, and then keep your mouth shut and allow Him to speak back to you? It's a key growth point for us if we want to experience something of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I do in the morning. I'm not saying that I have it perfect. I don't charge my telephone in our room. Okay, I get up with my watch that goes and then I switch it off and I don't touch my phone until I'm done with what I'm going to explain to you now. So my phone is in the study and then I would walk to the front of our house, I would switch on a light and I would go and sit on the couch and I would wait. I would wait for me to get out of my sleep And with everything that I went to sleep with, and everything that I woke up with, and I wait until I experience something of God's presence. And that starts my whole day. Because fam, you go to bed with stuff. Especially if you're a doom scroller before you go to sleep. And you wake up with stuff. Like, do you even know it? You wake up with stuff. Do you even know what stuff you have when you wake up? And I need to drill through those things in the morning to go, okay, God is with me, He's inside of me, He loves me, His mercy is new this morning, He's going to make the sun rise in about an hour's time, He's given me everything that I see with my eyes now and everything I can't see, and He wants to talk to me, like He's been awake the whole night going, can't wait for my boy to wake up, got some really solid things for for him planned today. And then I sit in that, and then I take my day from there. I cannot tell you the kind of things that I hear that time of morning, or the kind of things that I experience that time of morning. Like it's become a way of life. 
There's no way that I can get up and go, God, thank you for staying up the whole night. I know you've got a whole list of things that you want to tell me, but today I don't have time. Like, what am I going to do? Because I haven't heard what I'm supposed to do. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'll go into a day without any briefing. It'll be chaos. And that's when you hit survival mode. You just fly by the seat of your pants. Kind of wing it. I don't think that's solid discipleship. So we need to listen. My word, I'm going on way too long. So that was the first one. Who's the Holy Spirit? Got it? Okay, second one. What does He do? Let me show you the slide again. This is our teaching text. The Holy Spirit will teach you. You see it? He will remind you. Do you see it? And He will teach you and He will remind you of what? Everything I have told you. So what will He teach you? And what will He remind you of? Have you ever thought about that? Like, it's a great scripture. What will the Holy Spirit teach you? And what will He remind you of? Simple answer. The Word. The Bible. Because it comes from Him. Let me show you. Two slides. This is 2 Peter 1, verse 20 to 21. Christian Standard Bible. Peter says, above all, you know this. No prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation. Because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's beautiful, huh? So everything we have, God's spoken word that was later taken into His written word, comes from the Holy Spirit. Look what Jesus says in John 6, 63. He says, The Spirit is the one who gives life. The words that I have spoken to you are Spirit and are life. So what will the Spirit talk about? The words of Jesus, the words of God, and the Word of God. Check this. This is a ripper. The Apostle Paul, in two places, Ephesians 5, 18-19, and Colossians 3, 16. Look at the italics first. Okay? So Paul wrote to different churches in different places, but he wrote the same stuff, because some of those people struggled with the same stuff. So look, he says, uh, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, the Colossians version, admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Okay, cool. Look what he says in Ephesians. Be filled by the Spirit. And then he says what it looks like to be filled by the Spirit. That's the italics. Look what he says in Colossians. Let the Word of Christ dwell richly among you. And then he's got the same list. So which one is it? Be filled with the Spirit or dwell in the Word? Yes. <laughs> like that's the answer. Because the Spirit will teach you and remind you of what? The Word. So whether you are filled with the Spirit or dwelling in the Word of Christ, the Spirit will have you busy with the Word of Christ. That is why we hammer so hard on the Bible in this church. That is why we say we are a gospel-centered church, we are a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church, and that is why Lesecho and I and Peter and Shiami continuously tell you, read your Bible. Because the Spirit wants to teach you about it, and He wants to remind you about it. And if you don't have it, or if you've heard it, or it's not in your heart, what is He supposed to talk to you about? Because that's His script. That's what He does. Once again, Think about the guest in your house, right? Let's say I have a professor of paleontology in my house. Do you know what that guy will talk about? Or lady? They'll talk about paleontology because that's their specialist field. That's their vibe. So whether I meet them in the study or in the lounge or down around the dinner table, it's going to be paleontology the whole time. That's what the Spirit does. So if the Spirit is in you and dwelling in you, He will be talking about the Word the whole time. Do you know it? Do you study it? And do you read it? You see, because there's a dynamic conversation between you and the Spirit. As He speaks, you learn. And as you learn, you speak to Him about it. Do you see it? It's not a lecture. It's a conversation. So as I read the Bible and as it illuminates it to me, I learn something about it and then I speak to the Spirit about it and then the Spirit reinterprets and illuminates it again. It's objective knowledge and it's subjective knowledge. Think of your favorite food. I'm just going to use sugar as a blanket statement. Like I could tell you about red velvet cake. I knew I was going to hit someone <laughs> with that. 
And I can tell you all about it, about how marvelous it tastes. Oh my word, I should not go down that rabbit trail now. So you could know it, but the proof, fam, is in the eating, in the so-called pudding, right? And once you've had it, all the objective knowledge of the glory of red velvet cake will come back to you. Because now you've experienced it after you've known about it. Do you see? So that's what the Holy Spirit does. He teaches us. And then the Holy Spirit does another thing. Rudolf, if I can have John 14 on again, please. The Holy Spirit is called the Counselor. Now, if you are a Bible nerd and you would draw up different translations of this verse, you'll see that this word counselor has got many translations in many different versions. Why? Because the word is simply too rich to convey the full meaning in one word. So comforter is another common one. Counselor is one that the Christian Standard Bible chose for. None of them could explain the whole word. It's a Greek word. The verb is para. Kaleo, it's one word, but it's got two parts. Para kaleo. The noun is paraklesis, and the subject or the name for the one who does paraklesis while doing parakaleo is paraklete or paraklete, if you want to, right? So para means standing alongside. Not in front, not at the back. Hip to hip. Zip. This is para. Hello, para. How are you? No, I'm joking. This is para, okay? Kaleo means argue, declare, or call. So one who stands next to you and argues, declares, and calls. That is the counselor. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. So, probably the best way to say is another legal advocate. I think that's one of the most accurate translations of this word. One that represents you, one that is for you, one that is loyal to you, one that fights for you, one that defends you, and one that makes a case against your enemies. That is a legal advocate. And Jesus says, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, will be sent to you. And he will be with you forever, in verse 16 and 17 that we saw. So on the one hand, soft and sympathetic, and on the other hand, fighting and arguing. That's the Holy Spirit. I think there's three great verses explaining both of these sides to it. Let's read it together. This is Romans 8, from verse 15 to 17 in the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, the emphases are mine. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Okay? Don't be afraid. Instead, check, you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we also may be glorified with him. The spirit, check, defends us against Accusation and against temptation. When you doubt if God loves you, the Spirit says with your spirit that you are God's child. Do not doubt and do not fear. I'm right next to you. I'm against your hip. I've got you. And I will tell whatever is coming at you that you are God's child and that you've been adopted into His family and that they have no right to do against you what they want whether that is physical or spiritual. Right? Do you see it? So arguing to this side, dude, stay in the game, and arguing to this side, stay away, because this is God's child. That's the Holy Spirit, fam. There's a lot of power in that, isn't there? This is probably the best way to explain it. Go with me. I wrote one really long Pauline sentence. Paul is prone to writing really long sentences. As he teaches and reminds us, he helps us to stand firm by arguing for us against our enemies, against accusation and against temptation, and with us when we want to go astray. Do you see that? So if ever we doubt in our identity, in the fact that we've been adopted, and in the fact that we've got a marvelous inheritance coming to us, the Spirit turns from arguing against your enemies to arguing against you for you. 
You know, dude, stay in the game. Your inheritance is coming. You are God's child. You've been adopted. Have you got me? Now get with me and let's get on with this. That's how the spirit operates. Okay, so I said, the counselor, the Greek word is paraclete. Okay? So there's a way that I want you to remember this. All credit for this illustration goes to Pastor Joby Martin of the Church of 1122. Let me show you a picture. In South Africa, we call these boots. Or we call it togs. Or Afrikaans boys would call it talks. In America, it's called cleats. A pair of cleats. Paraclete, pair of cleats. Do you see it? So you've got a pair of cleats with you forever. What do you do with a pair of cleats? It helps you to navigate the field. It helps you to change direction. It helps you to not slip. And it helps you to stand firm when you need to uh, tackle someone or when you need to, uh, when you need to stop one, uh, someone coming at you. A pair of cleats, guys! Paraclete, pair of cleats. That's all Joby Martin. But now you know. Now you know. That's the Holy Spirit. That is what He does. Okay, so who He is, what He does. We've covered that. Third one. How do we receive what He gives? I've got two words for you. Faith and hospitality. Do you remember earlier in the sermon I asked you, do you want this? And most of you said, yes we do. So how do I get this? Firstly, faith. You have to believe that the Spirit wants to live inside of you. It's just how it is. Think about this illustration, door. You'll never get up to go and open the door if you don't believe that there is someone at the door. But when you get up to open the door for someone, you are not 100% sure who it is or what's going to happen, but there's evidence that there's someone there. That's all you have. But it compels you to get up because that's enough evidence that there's someone waiting for me at the door. You'll never get up to go and open the door if you don't have that conviction that someone is waiting for you. When it comes to the Holy Spirit fam, the only thing that I can tell you is I've been preaching for 33 minutes and I think that's enough evidence for you to go and open the door. But you have to have faith. You have to believe that the Spirit is waiting for you there and that the Spirit wants to move in and take up permanent residence in your life. And then, secondly, you have to practice hospitality. When you do open up your heart for the Spirit, you're going to have to be welcoming. You're going to have to be mindful of Him. You're going to have to be attentive to Him. Because He's not a guest for only a couple of days. He is a lifelong companion and roomy, and he wants to move in for real. You can't open the door and go, Eta, and then carry on with your life. That's never going to work. It's never going to work. And you'll never experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You need to welcome him in a hospitable way. Is this for real? Is this for me? Is this for you? Is this for all of us? The answer is absolutely yes. And forever. How can I say forever? Let me show you one last portion of scripture. This is 1 John 2 verse 1 to 2. This is the writer, John, the same person who wrote the gospel that we just read from. Look what he says. My little children, I'm writing you these things that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Come on! Who's the advocate? Is it Jesus or is it the Holy Spirit? Yes. It's Jesus first and then another, right? Which is the Holy Spirit. So look, John says, 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He Himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. The payment that satisfies. The payment that settles it. Right? The payment that clears it all up. The payment that covers the debt. That's who Jesus is for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Fam, do you know that Jesus Christ makes a case for justice with God the Father for you every single time it's needed? Do you know that the Holy Spirit makes a case for you against your accusations, against your temptations, against your weaknesses, and against your failures every single time it's needed? They do the same work. Check this. This is my last thought. Stay with me now. Have you ever thought that God might get fed up with forgiving you? Have you ever had this picture that Jesus goes to God and goes, uh, God, I'm back. Uh, Reino, yeah, yes. This is probably the 1538th time that he's done this. Look, if it's okay with you, please just grant him some forgiveness. I mean, I don't know what to do with this guy anymore. That's not how Jesus operates. Jesus makes a case for justice for you every time you sin. Do you know how he makes that case? Here's what he says. God, you are holy. And you punish sin. And Reino sinned. So Reino deserves punishment. But I paid for it. So if you want justice, I already paid for his sin, so he should be acquitted of that sin. That is how Jesus makes a case for us with God the Father. So it is a, a, from a loving, just, fair, holy God, it is just to forgive me for my sins. Because someone paid for it already. And he can't punish me for something that's paid for. Guys, that's the gospel. And that's the good news for all of us. It doesn't matter how many times it is. I mean, I kind of shortchanged myself there by saying 1,500. It's probably like 15 millionth time that I've done sin. And Jesus makes that case every time. And do you know what the Holy Spirit does? Every single time, the Holy Spirit takes a spotlight and He shines it on Jesus and He reminds you of exactly this that I just explained. That's what a spotlight is for. A spotlight shines radiant light on an object so that you can see it clearer. That's what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is the spotlight that shines it on Jesus and tells you while standing next to you, hip to hip to, hip to you, look what Jesus does for you. Not only did for you, but still does for you. Do not give up. Do not fall into the, this temptation again. Let's try again. I am with you, Boyke. That's how the Holy Spirit operates. He's our counselor. I want to ask you to respond. I think there's two responses. And I think the one response is either faith or hospitality. Or both. But I can tell you is if you say by faith today... I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to make permanent residence in my heart and I'm going to welcome Him. I'm going to walk to the door and I'm going to open up. You will find deeper on the other side. You will. If you have faith and you've opened up the door to Him but you've given Him the eta and you've carried on with your own life, then maybe hospitality is your response. Maybe that's what you need to do. Say, Holy Spirit, I, I don't even know where in my house you are. But I'm going to look for you until I find you. And then I'm going to reorder my whole life. And have you be the center role player. Like, I'm going to, I, I want you next to my hip, man. I want you to counsel me. I want you to teach me. And I want you to, to remind me. It's either of those two would be an appropriate response for us to finish out this whole series. So I don't know where you land. But let me pray for you. And then somebody will lead us in a last song. Holy Spirit, we believe... We believe, we believe that you are at the door and that you want to make residence in our lives. We have enough evidence, Holy Spirit, that makes it worth it to walk to the door and to welcome you in. So I want to pray for my brothers and sisters who's heard the knock, who's felt it many times, and who just haven't had the conviction to get up and open the door. Father God, 
Compel them through your spirit to get up and open the door. Move into our lives. We welcome you. And Holy Spirit, I pray for, for those of us who've had you in our house for a long time, but we haven't been hospitable to you. Will you give us the, the love and the courage and the grace and the mercy to once again draw close to you and to experience you in this deep and intimate way? Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've made atonement for every time we've sinned against you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you remind us of the beauty of the gospel every time we fail. Empower us. Take up residence. You are welcome in our hearts. We are looking for deeper, Holy Spirit. Take us deeper. We pray that in your name. Amen. Thank you.